This week on Business Mike, the business of online marketing. My guest today is Diane Basemera. She's the founder and CEO of Amoti, an online marketplace that provides easy access to African inspired art, culture, fashion and other products. In today's show, Diane shares the story of how she started her company as well as some of the challenges she experienced and how she overcame them. All this and more next on Business Mike. You're listening to the Business Mike podcast. Amazing interviews with inspiring entrepreneurs. For more amazing interviews, go to www.businessmike.com or download our podcast every Monday from Pod Africa. Hello and welcome to another episode of Business Mike. My name is Daudi Mugabe and joining me today is Diane. Diane, can you please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do? Okay. So, uh my name is Diane Basamera and I'm an online entrepreneur. Well, by that I mean I'm an entrepreneur really best online. You won't get me physically. Well, unless of course we have meetings. But I am the founder and CEO of amoti.org and um, amoti is an online marketplace that provides easy access to African inspired art, culture and fashion. Right, and I've been on your website. So the way I understand it is like Amoti is almost like Amazon, only that the people can put uh, items onto the website themselves and those items are African typically. Exactly. Yeah, you you that's that's the other catch line or the metaphor I use to describe my business. Um, if I don't want to get into so many explanations, I'll always say it's the Amazon for Africa. Yes, it's a marketplace, the Amazon for Africa. So we encourage, we sellers get on, they sign up and they create their own storefronts. You know, they manage their store by uploading their inventory. They upload pictures of their inventory and price them and sell them. It's the same thing as Amazon does. And um, they ship their products. If they are in the U.S., they're able to, if the sellers are based in the U.S., they ship their own products. But if the sellers are in other parts of the world, especially Africa, I encourage them to send their inventory to our warehouse where we keep all the things, you know. So, so that's what the business is about. It's about any product that is inspired by Africa, uh, right from art, by art I mean, you know, the paintings, the sculpture, uh, the fashion, is the clothes, the jewelry, the shoes and the bags. Every product on the platform is fully described with information to, you know, explain where, where was it made from. Was it made from Uganda? Was it made from Sudan? Was it from, made from Nigeria? And was, what, what inspired it? Is it inspired by the River Nile? Is it inspired by a certain tribe in a certain country? So it, that's the whole sharing the culture. Right. Now, I ask every guest I have on the show, what inspired them to start their business? So in your case, what were you doing before you started Amoti? And what is it about this business that made you start it in the first place? Uh, okay. So I have a degree in information technology. And I loved that. And, you know, I started from Uganda, Makere University. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who I feel like I'm able to do anything that I'm put a task to. So the first job I got was in the media. I worked for the national newspaper, the New Vision, and I worked there for four years. And on my fourth year, I moved to the U.S. I, I was just ready for a bigger challenge and something exciting. And when I got to the U.S., I did my first IT job, which is interesting because, uh, you know, when I got here, people discouraged me. They're like, oh, you know, you immigrants, when you immigrants come here, you're supposed to get into things like nursing. That's all you can do. That's the only place you, you can easily get into. But I was like, hey, listen, I have a whole freaking degree. You know, I studied so hard at Macquarie University and I, I'm not going to throw that away. I didn't do it in Uganda, but I'm going to do it in the U.S. So I got my job in the U.S. as an IT support uh, at Tech Networks of Boston. And 
I worked so hard, of course, as an immigrant in a country like the U.S. You're doing your best. You always have to shine. You know, you have to, you, you, you know, you have to, you're trying to, you know, people wonder, okay, she's from Africa. She has this education from Africa and she's working here. So you have to prove to them, you have to kill the whole stereotype in their mind. And I did that and I did it well. And uh, you come here to the U.S., you meet so many people. So I, I met this friend through my life journey. And he, a very special friend, by the way. And uh, it was his birthday. And I thought, okay, so he's, he's American, I'm Ugandan. And how am I going to amuse my friend for a birthday gift? So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to get him something Ugandan. So remember, I had this IT job. I'm very busy, nine to five. You know, I don't even have, I don't have time. I have to take care of my son. Uh, so I go online. I'm like, okay, let's see. What Ugandan thing can I get online? I go online. I don't find anything. I'm like, huh? how is it possible that there is nothing? Nothing. I wanted to get something like, a, you know, a sculpture of sorts. I look, but again, you know, like any other co online consumer, you're not so patient. You know, life has to go on. You look, look, nothing. Shake on another side, nothing. I'm like, okay, how come nobody has done this? How come somebody can't just get online and search for a product they want and have it shipped to them? How come I can go to Amazon and order for a dress and get it in five days, but if I'm going to get anything Uganda, I have to find somebody come from, coming from Uganda to send it to me. Or I'm going to order for it, but I have to wait for like a whole month to get it. And then I have to pay some ridiculous price for it. And I was like, no, 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 this, no, life can't be like this. Life has to be simple, smooth, and affordable. So I thought, so that's how the idea came. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to solve this problem. There is a, there is a gap here. Nobody seems to be, to have done it. And if there is anybody doing it, I can't find them online. They are not Googleable if they are out there doing it. So I got the idea. I got the idea, but I was going on with work. I kept thinking of this idea so much. And like the passion built up, built up so deep and so fast within me to the point where I just wasn't sleeping at night. I was just thinking of the possibilities, the possibility of being able to Google a product online and having it delivered to you in the US at least in five days at an affordable price. You know, I just kept thinking about it and the excitement built up. I couldn't sleep anymore because of this idea. I, I started getting eye bugs. I was like, okay, if I'm going to get any sleep in my life, I need to do this. I need to put this either, either brainwash my mind out of this idea or just do it, you know. So I decided to do it. I started. I said, okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to have a platform designed. I'm going to run social media and I'm going to try to find sellers. And then I started. So getting everything together actually required time. You know, you have to do a lot of research. You're seeing, you're digging up things online. Are there any people doing this? And if they are doing it, why couldn't I find them in the last two weeks when I was looking for a gift? You know, you're doing all this research. So the energy built up, the enthusiasm built up to the point where I wasn't concentrating at work. So I said, okay. Now it's time to decide. I'm either going to, because I like to do things really well. Everything I do, I want to do my best. I like to do excellent work. So I decided I'm either going to do this IT job excellently, like I've always done, or I'm going to do my project excellently. And, you know, sometimes people think, oh, these African-owned businesses are half-hazard, half you know, substandard and all. I was like, no, if I'm going to do a business, it's going to be excellent. So I had to choose right there and then. I said, I'm either going to continue with my IT career or I'm going to do this. But, if, but this other idea is so exciting that I can't sleep, yet I can't sleep. With my IT job, I can't sleep. You know, I go home, sleep, have a pro proper, you know quality sleep but with this idea it's so exciting I don't sleep well so I I put in my resignation at work I told them um, I'm gonna take some time off and 
figure out my life because I have this exciting idea that is making me, you know, not work to the best of my abilities. And yeah, that's how I started amoti.org. Right now, you mentioned the research in there. Now, that research obviously involves a couple of things. For instance, a platform like yours, um, you should be able to get in touch with people that are willing to upload or sell items that are African, but then also you need to be able to find the people to buy them. So how do you go about bridging those two things? Because they're two different um, stakeholders who are very key for your business to be successful. Okay, so first of all, this business was officially launched May 1st this year, 2016. And I I started the conversation, I spoke to potential sellers and consumers, but really the actual the actual action starts when the platform is ready and people can now see what is going on and how they're going to use it. So that started this year in May. And at first I went all out, um, you know, just going out there to festivals or wherever there, there were many people and thinking that, oh, I'll, I'll pick whoever gets on board, if it's a consumer, if it's a seller, first, you know, whoever I get on board first is what's going to work. I quickly learned that in the beginning and realized that, no, it's you have to create a strategy. And my strategy lately has been finding the sellers. My strategy is to fill the, fill the marketplace with as many sellers as I can. Uh, how am I finding these sellers is the question you had. So I have been, first of all, I've been finding them on social media. There are different people trying to do uh, different things out there, but many of them don't have a website. You know, they don't have that web portal where products can be shopped online, but they use their social media campaigns and are found locally. So I've used social media. I've gone out there to cultural events or festivals and talked to people directly and, you know, gathered their contacts and told them, listen, this is what's happening. Uh, Get on board and, you know, sell. Uh, With the consumers, I have, while attending these festivals, I've also had to sell inventory because as as I talked about, as I've been talking about my business, you know, I've had to display what do you mean by African inspired products. So you, at these events, you show them that, so this is what an African inspired dress would look like or the jewelry or the bag. So that way, that's how I've also been picking up uh, potential consumers or even consumers themselves. I've been out there. I network a lot. I'm always attending events around Boston. So that's our phone sellers and consumers. And then, of course, there is the whole reference. You know, when you do a good job, people refer you. Earlier, you mentioned that some of the probable companies that were perhaps doing what you're doing now were not easily found online. But what else or what other reasons did you notice for some of these companies not existing in the first place? Because sometimes we want to start a business, but then probably somebody else has thought of the same idea, but for some reason it hasn't worked. What were some of the few things you noticed as to why a business just like this didn't exist in the first place? So, okay, so going around and finding these sellers, potential sellers and the sellers, the actual sellers, when you talk to them, they'll tell you, one, it's challenging and expensive a market website, sell their products. It's challenging setting it up, maintaining it, and you know, following up all that stuff. It's a lot of work and it's expensive, so they haven't really done it. And then from my own experience, I have realized that uh, you can't, unless you have a big team, you can't really be a producer and a web designer, a, a web admin and a marketer. You can't be, let me break it down, you can't be a fashion designer. You can't be the guy who's going to come up with the designs and be the same guy who's going to come up with a good website and be the the same person who's going to market your product. You need help with these things. So you're either going to employ a team to do this for you or you're going to take on a service like mine 
where you're going to get a storefront and we're going to market it for you and you're not going to you're not going to be the only person in the marketplace there are going to be other sellers and you're going to tap on to the consumers for those other sellers so uh many of these people have had that challenge of creating websites the challenge of marketing themselves because you know to do anything well especially in the u.s it's, it's a little bit not like uganda the dynamics here there is a lot of uh People are so into doing things the professional way. I can't even, they are so into the whole keeping the standard, keeping high quality. You know, it's, it's about quality. It's about the standard. It's about the professionalism. If you think you're going to create a product and it's just not done to perfection, nobody's going to buy it. If you think you're going to put up a website and it's just, you know, not like to perfection nobody's gonna go there and honestly it's challenging for these uh small business owners to do all these things so so many of them have focused on just producing their creating their product uh the ones who have websites haven't figured out how to be googleable you know how to appear on the first page or the second page of google if somebody uh types in African products or African goods, they, you know, they haven't figured out how to do that. And from what I have learned from my own experience, it requires, you know, such engine optimization. And that in there is an investment. It's an investment that can only be understood by a marketer, not not by a creator. But, you know, a creator would understand it too. But, you know, so people... A creator will look, okay, should I invest in my product? Should I invest in creating this shoe or bag? Or should I invest in such engine optimization? Now, I'm talking about small business owners or startups. I'm not talking about the big companies. Well, I haven't yet known of any African doing something big that is all over the park. But So it's, it's a question of priorities. And many of them are small businesses who have priorities. What else? So the niche I'm basically, the gap I'm feeling in this business is creating a market where I'm, these people already have a market, but I'm expanding their market even more. I'm expanding their market from the local market to something bigger and international. I am solving the problem of the people who don't want to get into creating websites, people who don't want to get into marketing. And yeah. Right, no, and I think it's a very good uh, model because even if you are someone who, let's say, who has a product that you want to sell in Uganda, if someone is interested in something from Nigeria, but then your Ugandan product is next to theirs, they might be curious and say, oh, I might as well get something from Uganda. So being on a platform that has... Um, items that are being sold from a variety of country and tribes, as you mentioned, because even one country can have very many items depending on the number of tribes. That, in a way, enhances the brand of each and every one of these particular individuals. And obviously, if you're doing the heavy lifting on the technology side in terms of where their particular shop resides, their online shop, as well as the marketing of their products, then then it's a it's a win win for them. Exactly, exactly. And uh, Amoti dot org does have that functionality. Uh, if you get in there, if a person creates a store, they can see that um, you know you can create your profile uh, where you're located. People will see that oh, he's located in Uganda, he's located in Nigeria, he's located in South Africa, and you know you put up your little story and say oh the products i'm making are inspired by these or these products are, are made by uh women in uh sudanese women who are you know struggling to pay school fees for their kids so so there we have that blog element on the platform where people can you know tell their story and you know tell people why they are doing what they're doing so it's it's uh, it's really some fancy thing going on at Amoti.org. Right, and the name Amoti.org, uh, how did you come up with that? What was the inspiration? Um, really? <laughs> okay, so first of all, Amoti comes from my tribe. I am a Ugandan. I come from the Toro tribe. 
and we have pet names and I just thought I should do something that represents where I come from. So Amoti is a pet name and there's so many pet names but I picked out Amoti because um, I just like the first two letters it starts with. Really, it was a very simple reasoning for me. Uh, I wanted Amoti to appear first on the directory. Any directory, Amoti will appear first. Uh, secondly, uh, Amoti will appear next to Amazon because I have that AM thing going on. Really nothing big, nothing. You know, it's just silly, silly facts. It's just, you know, silly but important and influential in one way or the other. You know, it's... Uh, it's an opportunity, an opportunity. I just thought it's a little window that I should open for myself that way. Also, Amoti means flower. Amoti means flower, and uh, flowers mean a lot to me. So, yeah, it's all that. That's how I got the name. Right, and obviously, getting a name that is unique is very important, as you mentioned earlier, for search engine optimization. So if you have a name or if your brand has a combination of letters that is unique to anything else, as soon as someone types that in Google, for sure it will come up on the very first page, simply because nothing else like that exists. So uh, your name, Amoti, is one of those examples which stands out for sure as a, as a brand name. Yeah, thank you. I just want to get back to another point that you mentioned earlier. When you say that um, some of the business people, they don't know where to invest first, especially when they're starting out. So this this happens so many people, myself included. You, when you're starting a company and you're building a brand and there's so many directions you can go in. Do I focus on the product? Do I focus on the marketing? Do I focus on the branding? Do I look for customers now? What? There's so many things you can do and sometimes you need advice from either someone or something. So in your case, do you have an individual that you normally interact with for help or are there any particular websites that maybe you refer to for some of this business advice? It's important to have a support group. And I have support in the U.S. I, I meet with like-minded entrepreneurs. There are different organizations here where, you know, you get different trainings. And one of the trainings that, you know, one of the things that I ignored in the beginning was that I didn't consider very important was writing a business plan. You know, uh, you know, when you tell somebody, yeah, I'm starting a business, da, 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 they'll say, okay, have you written a business plan? And you're like, no, my, but I know my idea and I know how exactly it's going to run and I know what I need to do. But that's not enough. You need to write a business plan. And by the time you're done writing or drafting that business plan, your idea has you, you you know you start to look at your idea differently and you know exactly what you want and it's this plan that will kind of give you a direction you know so after doing that business plan you then write out a strategic plan now that i have my business idea it's here because the other thing is that if you also don't write a business plan it's so easy to stray off the main reason why you started what was your mission why, why am I doing this? What problem am I solving? What need am I catering to? Or what pain am I trying to take away? The business plan helps you stay on, on board, online to whatever. Online, online of what you're trying to do. After the business plan, write out a strategic plan. I know that everybody has a strategy in their head because, of course, their heads work. They say, okay, I'll start with this, then I'll do this, I'll design a website, and after designing a website, I'll look for uh, sellers, and after sellers, I'll do this and that. No, that's not enough. You need to write down things. There is power in writing. There is the way your mind processes things differently when you write things down. So a strategic plan will help you prioritize what is important to your business and what may be important for my business may not necessarily be the same priority for your business. So writing it down helps. I have a mentor. Um, my mentor is a very smart man and uh, he's, you know, he's been around, he's done, he's started business startup. He's, he has many startups of his own and um, he's the kind of person, actually I have two mentors, he's the kind of person I'll talk to and say, you know what, I'm having a bad day, I feel like nothing is going on. Like, I, I'm, I just, 
you know, I tell him that I just need, right now I need to be in this place, but I'm still here. So he's he's given me so much advice on what to do. And some of the advice he's given me is, you know, managing my time and being real with what my present life is, you know. That kind of support is really helpful, that's writing out things. Um, so we've done a lot of time management, making to-do lists. So, you know, you can always do that to-do list in your head and all, but writing them down totally gives you a whole different experience, totally different. Um, being real with your life, where am I? What can I do right now? What is my potential right now? How many hours do I realistically have in a day? The truth is that we have 24 hours and not 28. And uh, you have to remind yourself of such things, not going overboard. Because when you go overboard, you're, you know, you're distracting your usual routine and your health. And it affects your thinking the next day or the way you operate. So, yeah, that's the kind of support I've had. Um, no, that's, that's very important as a business owner because every once in a while, even if it's a, a fellow business person that has just started, like yourself, um, sometimes your colleague might experience something that you will probably experience down the line, but they've experienced it before you. So the more you interact with fellow entrepreneurs, the more you learn because they might tell you that this is the challenge I had and this was the way I resolved it. So if this ever crosses your path, this is how you go about it. And sometimes we, well, entrepreneurs in a weird way, because they're able to formulate an idea that can generate money, there's a tendency to believe they're smart, so they don't necessarily sometimes accept advice from other people, or sometimes they live in a bubble or a cocoon that I, I think this is the way it should be solved. I think it should go like this. I think, I think, as opposed to interacting with other people like themselves or even people, as you mentioned, who are far more experienced that have seen everything they're seeing at the moment a hundred times. And it's it's definitely... Um, one of the few things that not many entrepreneurs do that, that I think should be done more often. I think I've also found a few support groups on uh, social media. So I I get into those groups and see what the conversation is. And it's definitely, you know, you, can, you can't do things alone. You always need help. You can't say, I'm going to do this alone. You always need help. For those people who maybe um, want to do exactly what you're doing, for instance, you said you have support groups on social media. Is this something you Googled and it came up and now you're part of the group? Did you get to join through a friend? How does someone um, get to interact with fellow entrepreneurs? Like what, what resources are out there, at least the ones that you've found? Um, so the ones I've found are based in the U.S. And uh, I'll just talk about them. They could be similar organizations wherever somebody is located. Um, for example, I, uh, there is this center for women enterprise and these are women entrepreneurs. It's in the U S in Boston. And it's, I, I bet there is something similar out there in whatever country somebody is, but this is really best in Boston and it's about Bostonians and, you're with women entrepreneurs and, you know, we have certain types of challenges that male entrepreneurs may never really understand. So that's a very good support group. Uh, I just Googled that one. And I think just Googling, you know, putting in those keywords, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs, male entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, startups, putting in such keywords in the search engine or in the search social media will help you find like-minded people. Another support group I'm in is uh, African-owned businesses. That's still best in the U.S. So uh, the Africans in the U.S. trying to do businesses and different things. And we also have our own challenges, you know, the challenge of being another race and having to get other races. Sorry to sound a little bit racial, but it's the reality. You know, how do you break through in a multicultural uh, country, U.S. is very multicultural, but as a black person, how do you break through? How do you shine through? Um, another support group I'm in is, uh, what is it? Um, you know, there's just, there are just so many. Um, in the U.S., we have uh, 
there there is that organization for mentors it's called score score is still a u.s best thing where you're gonna go and find mentors then there is the mass challenge it's the massachusetts challenge um entrepreneurs get in there and they are challenged with different activities they pitch you know you learn pitching you know there is so much out there and you also look at what you're doing. There, there's always somebody doing something similar or who has done it before. You just have to go there and just dig up the wide, wild web. Dig it up. There's always something and there are people out there. Right. Now, you mentioned the business plan and the business strategy, strategy and the importance of those. Um, from your side, um, how is it that Amoti makes money? Do you charge the people that are selling to you a fee to be on the platform or do you get a commission from something that the buyers uh, pay to the sellers? Okay, that's a very good question. So um, what Amoti does is we, we ask you to list as many products for free. You know, it's totally free. You can put on as many products as you want. And then we will ask you to take quality photography, you know. And things have to look good because the web is about the visual experience. And then if a sale is made, when a sale is made, we charge you a percentage of your sale. Uh, Right now, since we have just started, we charge 3% of every sale. And then we'll also charge you 3.5 of the processing fee. Uh, the processing fee, that's the credit card, you know, processing and all. So, yeah, those are our charges. Very, very affordable, meaning anybody should get on there. You're still going to make your money. Uh, the seller is making the best out of it. I am I'm relying on the number of sellers to make my profit. The more sellers I have, the better it is for me. But even if you're the only, you know, even if there are a few sellers, a seller is still getting like literally ninety, ninety four percent of their profits, and that's very affordable. Now, from the part of the seller, um, especially for those who are in Africa, or yes, in Africa, because your products are African, um, if someone say where you are right now in, in Boston orders for something, how then do I, Dowdy in Uganda, get it to you? Do I, is the cost of shipping it to the address on me? Like, do I, you know, go to DHL or something and type your address and then I pay DHL or is that charged to me or how, how does that, that whole fee, especially the one to transport the item to the, to the location, how is that worked out? Okay, so a, a consumer pays for their shipping mm -hmm. and your shipping cost depends on where you're located. Uh, right now, shipping is only in the U.S. To, to people residing, shipping to people residing in the U.S. Uh, let's say, Dawoodi, you're a seller in Uganda, and, uh, you know, you have your inventory, you're selling men's shirts, and um, you want to sell on a moti. I'm going to encourage you to join our fulfillment, warehouse fulfillment program, because that's the only way you, you and I are going to succeed, as well as a consumer. Um the reason why we do that, we ask you to send bulk inventory is because it's cheaper to send bulk to the warehouse. And then when it's at the warehouse, Amorti will ship it for you around the U.S. That shipping is much more affordable than you sending just one shot through DHL or FedEx to somebody in the U.S., uh, remember, you're not the one paying for the shipping anyway. So you may say, eh, I'm not the one paying. I'm not losing anything. For me, my shirt is still $50 and that's just it. Um, no, a consumer won't really, a, a consumer may lose interest because uh, of your shipping costs. They'll look at, oh, shipping from Uganda to the U.S. is going to cost me another $30. And this shirt is probably worth $30. Mm -hmm. or, so somebody will say, wait, those are two shirts, but you know it won't make sense to them. So we encourage sellers out there who are in Africa to ship in bulk, and then we ship it from them around the U.S. Uh, for the sellers, there are some sellers based in the U.S. We ask those sellers to ship their own products, 
and the customer doesn't have to, I mean, the seller doesn't have to pay anything for the shipping. The shipping cost is on the consumer and it depends on where the consumer is located. Uh, and then we have shipping, shipping is done by UPS. We are only working with UPS because we want a centralized form of shipping where everybody can track it. The consumer can see that the product has left Boston and it's heading all the way to Texas and they're getting all these updates on the product. And um, also for the seller, in this case, if it's a what is selling, I can print out a shipping label. If let's say it's a seller based in the US, they print out a UPS shipping label. They don't even have to have a a penny on them to to fulfill their their transaction. All you have to do is print the shipping label because the consumer has already paid for it, stick it on the package and just put it at any UPS store or give it to any UPS truck and they'll deliver it. And that's it. Very simple. Final question. Uh, if you were cast away to a desert island and you could only take one of each, what book would you take with you? What movie would you take with you? And what song would you take with you? Lately, I'm into reading the whole philosophy. I think it's because of where I am in my life. And the book I would carry with me is Think and Grow Rich. That's the serious book I would take with me, Think and Grow Rich. Uh, you know, I can't help but mention that at the end of the day, we entrepreneurs, we're about creating that social impact, that change in, the, in, la in society, but we also like our money you know <laughs> we 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 want to create a change but we want to benefit from creating that change we want to change people's lives out there but we also want to earn from creating that change so think and grow rich would be the book i'll take but if it's a fun book i would you know i would take anything by john grisham i like john grisham that's i find that so thrilling i like the client by john grisham what movie would I take with me? I would take The Godfather. I would take The Godfather because everybody talks about The Godfather, but I've, I've really, I've never gotten time to watch The Godfather. I'm more into the social life, being with people. I don't really sit down to watch TV. I'm more into human interaction, and I've never, I never really have that time to sit down. So I guess on an island, I'll sit by myself and watch The Godfather and know about what people talk about, what people, you know, praise, you know, what, the big deal. I want to see the big deal. Well, it's, it's, it's a bit like an, an entrepreneurial situation. The only difference is they, they tend to solve their problems in unique ways by maybe literally eliminating the competition. <laughs> well, I guess it's my kind of movie if we're talking about entrepreneurship. So, yeah. Um, what, what else? What's the third? A song. A song. song. Oh, my God. I love Madonna. I love Madonna of the 90s or the 80s. So if I would play one song of Madonna over and over again, it's like a prayer. Just like a prayer, you know I'll take you there. That's Madonna. That's my song. I like the old Madonna. It's so easy for us entrepreneurs to get lost into working without downtime, without sitting down to watch a, a movie or a book or a, or listen to music. Because, you know, if you're running your own business, everything is on you and you feel like, oh, my God, it's me. I'm answerable to myself. It's me. I decide. And, you know, you get lost into working for, what, 28 hours instead of, you know, having to work like for 12 hours and, you know, have some sleep. It's so easy for us to get lost in that. And um, my, I also, I didn't mention I have a career coach who's, who's also like my mentor, but his role is to, it's part of the support I have. His role is really to always check on me and ask, did you sit down on your couch this week? You know, because it's, it's so easy to get lost in working and working. And he asks me, did you sit on your couch? Did you, did you watch a movie? Did you turn on your TV? Did you, you know, did you uh, do such downtime things? So those things are very important to refresh and recharge 
And uh, I want to encourage people not to get lost. I don't know if other entrepreneurs face this, but it's my challenge. I just work and work nonstop and I obsess and I just don't stop and I just need help. I need somebody to remind me to sit on the couch and turn on the TV or, you know, get out and do something. So, yeah, it's important. People, don't underestimate the power of downtime. Yeah, actually, that reminds me of a conversation I was listening to not too long ago. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell was on, uh, actually saying this, and uh, he's into running, and he was saying that uh, runners actually have a very, very big challenge because when you're training for running, you have to push yourself, but not too much, because if you over-push yourself, you might get injured, and you can't afford that. So even when you've done your usual 10 laps, and you have a feeling of, can I just do the 11th lap? You know, that'll give me that extra edge. That discipline to say, no, nope, this is enough. I need to stop now. Otherwise, something will go wrong. It's not good for me. So it, it translates into business as well. Because we know we can and no one is stopping us, sometimes we go ahead and overwork ourselves. But just like an athlete, it might have damage to us. And just when we need ourselves to be 100%, we might be injured in a variety of ways. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. One more thing is to, uh, I want to encourage all the entrepreneurs and anybody listening to always stay positive and, and believe in what you're doing. Uh, because if you don't believe in what you're doing, nobody else is going to believe in it. I mean, they'll probably, yeah, they'll respect and say, oh, yeah, I acknowledge your idea and it's good. But you have to believe in it and stay positive on the journey. It's um, the journey to build something is always tough, but the rewards are at the end when everything is set up. So stay positive, stay with like-minded people who are positive, keep away from the negative people who will discourage you and say, oh, for only three months, is this all you've done? Oh, this and this and that. So keep positive, stay positive and meditate. Right, that brings us to the end of the interview. Thank you so much, Diane, for sharing all this expertise, you know, as a business owner and someone in the online field. How can people get in touch with you on your website or email or even social media to learn more about Amoti? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the website is www.amoti.org or just amoti.org. That's the website. Uh, the social media on Facebook, just search for Amorti. On uh, Instagram, search for Amorti uh, dash org. I'm on every platform. Just search for Amorti dot org or Amorti dash org. Amorti. And then, if you want to email me, email me at Diane B at Amorti dot org, which is D I A N B at Amorti, which is A m o o t i dot o r g or info dot o r g info at amoti dot o r g uh get on the website you'll get all the information you need to reach out and um i'm happy to receive any emails i tend to reply them as soon as i can unless life is happening so yeah well, thank you once again, uh, Diane, for everything you've shared with us today. And we wish you the very best with Amorti. Okay. Thank you, too. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thanks for listening to the Business Mike podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to listen to more episodes just like this one, simply go to businessmike.com. I would love to hear from you. So if you've got any questions or feedback, you can reach me on Twitter at Daudi Mugabe, on Facebook at Business Mike, or email. That's Daudi at businessmike.com. Don't forget, we have a brand new episode every Monday. And until then, take care.